myself. So, Moktasuma um, uh, Sparsa should be here by the end uh, for a, a discussion about the film. So, what I'd like to do is just briefly introduce um, uh, him. He's obviously, as many of you know, he's an award-winning filmmaker, producer, entrepreneur, and activist. You, you uh, also. Um, Notice that if you're ever making a documentary, you want to interview him because he'll end up being your implied narrator. He kind of really has a way of framing uh, issues very succinctly. Um, he has really worked tirelessly as an activist on many fronts, politically, but also in terms of integrating uh, the movie industry uh, and uh, the entertainment that we see. And toward that end, he uh, has established Maya Cinemas, which is a chain of uh, movie theater complexes that uh, serve uh, Latino communities. And probably by the end of next year, there'll be about 250 uh, such theaters. But he's been primarily known uh, for his uh, work as a producer, which includes uh, films such as Selena, introducing Dorothy Dandridge, The Milagro Beanfield War, Gettysburg, the, uh, the Ballad of Gregorio Cortez, and of course, Walkout. Uh, I should note that the Ballad of Gregorio Cortez, 1982, really set a framework for how to make uh, independent films that really provided uh, a, a kind of a path for other producers uh, throughout the 80s and into the 90s. And that included other uh, Chicano-focused films such as um, Stand and Deliver and also uh, And the Earth Did Not Swallow Him. Um, I, I kind of personally remember him uh, for one of the earliest feature films called Only Once in a Lifetime. Uh, it's a, a 1979. Uh, we actually have the film uh, preserved here at UCLA in the UCLA Film and Television Archive. Um, in his role as an actor, Esparza has founded the Los Angeles Acad Academy of Arts and, uh, and Enterprise Charter School. He's the co-founder of NALIP, the National Association of Latino Independent Producers, one of the other co-founders. Uh, and he's former chair of the New America Alliance, as well as a founding board member of the Sundance Institute. I could go on uh, extensively, except to say that he has been nominated for an Academy Award, a Golden Globe, and an Emmy, and has received more than 200 um, honors and recognitions uh, for his work. Uh, with that, uh, I will just note that um, for those of you wanting to know more about Moctezuma and about the work he's done, I encourage you to uh, schedule uh, with our librarian, Javier Flores, uh, to uh, go through and see the Moctezuma Esparza papers, which we have here. It's a rather extensive documentation of the, the life and work of one of the few Chicanos to really work extensively within um, the entertainment industry. Um, and I think that is what I was going to say. So uh, this is a film uh, produced by Moctezuma Esparza, uh, written by Victor Villasenor, and uh, directed by Edward James Olmos. Perhaps some of you would like to come up. There's just a few of us and we can have a more intimate conversation. You've just been cast in Moctezuma's new production called After Film Discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming up forward. I have a hard time watching this movie. Uh, even though I've seen it many times and uh, worked on it for 20 years, it, uh, it tears me up. The, uh, the emotional wounds are still very alive. So, reliving just seeing images on the screen uh, is uh, profoundly impacting to me. So I'm, I'm still uh, affected. 
Uh, in fact, I, I don't like to see the movie because it tears me up. Uh, I know that I have to be ready to uh, relive it. So having said that, I, I certainly welcome all of us to have a conversation. If you've got any questions about it. Mm -hmm. I wonder if I can start and we'll go ahead. Well, before this film, we saw, uh, you know, really a very powerful documentary starring you. Uh, you're kind of the uh, on-screen narrator, as it were, for the, for that documentary. Why was it important to to tell that story through a feature film? It's a very different approach. And, and what 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 did you hope that that would achieve? Well, I was very fortunate that HBO agreed to uh, finance the movie and air it. And I had been working with uh, the idea uh, since I became a filmmaker that this story had to be told and documented. Documentaries are for people who love uh, education and exploration. And it's a very limited, uh, select audience that watches documentaries. Uh, I spent 10 years doing documentaries in the 70s, and I was very fortunate. I got to make some documentaries that aired on national television and on PBS. But the audience is very small, and it's just the nature of the way that uh, the uh, hierarchy of entertainment uh, from something that's instructional uh, to something that is dramatic uh, appeals and attracts a much larger audience. And in this particular case, having HBO finance and exhibit the, uh, the movie guaranteed that a likely minimum of 20 million people would see the movie within one week. Because that's how many people HBO has as subscribers back when this movie was made. Now it's more, I think. Now it's like 30 million. So that alone has a far deeper reach into culture and society and provokes a much larger conversation and gives a, a context and a, a framework for understanding the demands and aspirations of uh, Chicanos and Latinos in the country. It changes the conversation with everybody else. Cha Cha, you had a question? First of all, I want to thank you so much. It was so emotional to me. I'm going to thank you so much. I, I, I'm going to get too like, emotional. But that just absolutely shot for me. I think this film has to be shown every year. It has to be shown at schools. It has to be shown about the struggle. And I want to ask, where are we now? Not you. I know where you're at. You're obviously, your commitment is there. It's, where is our community at at this point? Why, and I'm not going to say it has anything to do with you guys, maybe the freight rain, but this room should be filled. Not only just filled, this, this has to get out. I knew about it because I was raised during a time when I heard about it. You're a bit older than me. I do have the white hair, but you are a bit older than me. And the reality is, this has to be history, like every other Black Panther movie, this needs to be history. And whatever I can do to make it happen, I will do it. But this really affected me. Well, what I would ask all of you, if you're educators and you use this movie in the classroom, is to ask your students to write HBO and let them know how it impacted them. Because it's been now 12 years since this movie was made. And HBO hasn't done anything else that speaks to our history, our experience. And uh, they're the among, among the most progressive, right? So there are a few other series that are on television, but generally they're almost exclusively about the drug experience, the narcotraficante experience. And uh, so you can think about what's on Netflix or what's on Showtime. Uh, or what's on A&E or any of these other channels, and it's pretty much about drugs. Mm -hmm. So there are many stories that I know that Eddie Olmos has wanted to make, that others have been wanting to make, 
uh, that speak to our, our experience in the United States, our history, that Hollywood is not willing or ready uh, or believes that they merit being making, making them. Uh, they don't believe that we count, literally. They literally don't think we count. Uh, the fact that I've had a career in Hollywood is uh, almost, in my own eyes, looking back on it, miraculous. Because nobody else has been able to do it. You're the exception that proves the rule. It's unfortunate. Um, how important is it, since you, you got this chance, um, to make this? You, you made the opportunity for, for this film and made the case for it to then have the creative positions filled by other Chicano uh, filmmakers. Writers, writers, the directors, the... Um, well, I made that commitment when I yeah. made a choice to yeah. be uh, a producer. So when I was still here at UCLA, that was a stand that I took, that if that was a career choice I was going to follow, then uh, I was going to make a difference and open it up. So. Mm -hmm. Every movie that I've made, uh, that's been what I've done mm -hmm. and sought to do, uh, whether the movie was about Latinos or African Americans or American Civil War or whatever it might have been. Now, obviously, there's the other side of that, which is uh, the industry or with the, the platform or studio you're working with. Um, they don't necessarily see it that way. No, in fact, uh, right now, Hollywood is very satisfied with itself uh, because they gave an Oscar to a Mexican. Um, now, I'm, I'm, yeah, for the third time, uh, best picture, best director. They are extremely talented, exceptional human beings. Mm -hmm. However, and they all know each other, they all went to school together, they're all uh, compatriots from Mexico. Their careers were created in Mexico. They came here as stars. Hollywood effectively would view them no differently than if they had been German or French or from Spain or, uh, or Turkey or any other country in the world uh, where an extraordinary talent bursts on the scene because it was supported by their own national cinema. Mm -hmm. right? So we don't have that in the United States. We don't have a national cinema uh, or government that supports us. Mexico does. And so does... Argentina, and so does Chile, and so does Spain, and so does Cuba. So all these countries have filmmakers, and many of these filmmakers will reach to the United States because their talent has been proven in another country. Uh, I, I draw the analysis or the uh, analogy to would African Americans feel that their aspirations for inclusion in Hollywood be satisfied with a whole bunch of Africans from South Africa uh, coming here and making movies that have nothing to do with their experience in the United States, in fact, have nothing to do even with their experience in South Africa. That's the equivalent. And winning Oscars. And winning Oscars. So you can look at uh, Birdman and Revenant, uh, Gravity, and now uh, Shape of Water. They have nothing to do with any experience that's Latino or Latin American. Uh, or any real thematic. I mean, these filmmakers have declared themselves to be international world filmmakers, and they are. They are at the top of the game at a world level. But that has nothing to do with us. So you're really drawing a line or a distinction between telling a universal story, as Hollywood understands that, and telling a universal story with Chicanos and Latinos. Correct. The way that African Americans are now getting to do and have been doing mm -hmm. for at least 30 years. Mm -hmm. It's been about 30 years since uh, uh, Spike Lee uh, broke on the scene with She's Gotta Have It. Or She's Gotta Have It. Yeah. That, that's the demarcation. Any other questions? Yeah. You really need to toss it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I graduated from UCLA as a grad student decades ago, and I'm always flabbergasted by um, the number of letters I get to donate to the university every year, which I do in, in the law department. 
but I'm also very begrudgingly, very frequently refuse to give a dime because I always find that sometimes there's a disconnect from these palaces of education mm -hmm. to the people across the way. It was what I protested when I was a mm -hmm. student here. And she asked the question initially when we began, uh, why isn't this room full of young people? And that was the first question I asked my, my husband when I walked in. Where is the youth? Because without them, there is not going to be much growth. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, what is the Chicano Studies Department doing with the film department here at UCLA to really promote a connection between these departments and the dire need that, that we, I'm not Chicana, I am Puerto Rican from, from the East Coast, from New York, um, but what are we going to do to really promote making our own films, as you're saying, instead of just having uh, a, an international perspective? Um, I would, I, I don't know. Maybe there's a lot that UCLA's um, Chicano leadership is trying to do to really make sure that our youth and our promising young talented producers actually get a chance to make their good movies. I, I, I will uh, presume to speak for Chon. And then I will speak for Moctezuma. Good. <laughs> I, I sit on the executive board of the film school here at UCLA. And uh, on this executive board are very, very prominent CEOs of major corporations in Hollywood. And uh, some very, very wealthy people. Um, the dean, and I've said this to her publicly, so I'm not going to be shy about repeating it here, it doesn't understand the distinction between diversity in the United States and the world. Right. So she considers bringing in students from Asia or the Middle East uh, or Europe as more important than American Latinos in particular. And there are very few American Latinos in that film school, less than when I was a student at UCLA. Okay, so I was here a student in the film school uh, fall of 69 through 71, and then I was in grad school here I got an MFA, and I was instrumental in creating a program called Ethnocommunications. We started off with 12 students, uh, four Asian Americans, four Native Americans, four African Americans, um, and uh, four Chicanos. And that program lasted, I think, about 10 years. Wow, yeah. yeah. Where about 25% of the ad admissions to the film school back in the 70s were people of color. And there was a real commitment. That doesn't exist today. There is a greater commitment at AFI to diversity than here than UCLA. Yeah. That figure of 25% actually continued through the 90s when I started teaching here in 1992. And it was very notable. It was a very distinctive element of, of that particular film department that one-fourth of the uh, students coming in were Latino. Uh, now you're lucky if one or two, maybe a year at best. Uh, and Moctezuma is pointing out something that has really got more of a financial underpinning, that students coming from outside of the United States have to pay full ride and therefore generate a profit that offsets the other cuts that have been uh, brought to the uh, state budget for the university. That's not an excuse. Um, there is a ser very serious issue in terms of opening up the pipeline um, where it should be most flexible, which is in the universities, uh, as opposed to the studios or the networks. Um, One more note. Uh, I, I, you know, I, 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 I laud your declaration of your, your own heritage as Puerto Ricana. Uh, chair of Mecha at UCLA, was a Puerto Rican mm -hmm. in 1970. I fought for that in 1982. <laughs> <laughs> Elsa Garcia. Elsa was our chair. We're all Chico Boricua. <laughs> well, there is a connection. Um, any other question? I have one more. <laughs> I might as well use it while I can. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, usually people say I have a big mouth, but I guess in this case I didn't, huh? Um, 
It seems to be an issue that we are always washing out the Indian blood in the Mexican. And that's what seems to be a massive problem because everything else, and I, I don't have any problem with things moving into us culturally. We're mixing, but realistically, it's almost like the Indian was decimated. The Mexican, with our Indian blood, is not being uh, continued at what we are because we were natives of this land, pretty much. Uh, when the Spaniards came in, then we were changed. I used to have a line years ago saying, we did not cross the border, the border crossed us. us. That was a comedy line I used at the comedy store for many years and it was taken. But the reality is, we have lost that. And I'm really quite upset about that when I see that, and I speak a lot about that. Can you maybe broach that subject conversationally? Our movement was a declaration that we were indigenous people. The word Chicano is an Nahuatl word. Mm -hmm. It comes from Mexicano. And the name of our organization here was Mecha, Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano de Atzlan. So within the name, you have both an acknowledgement that yes, we are creatures of the colonial Hispa uh, Hispanic conquest, right? So we use the word Mecha, which means a match. And we also have two words that were indigenous and that declare what we were standing up for. So at least in our movement, uh, and uh, Chicano movement embodied our indigenous declaration of identity. Your line was used back in the early 60s by many. <laughs> I thought it came from my family, actually, the, from New Mexico, because they kept using it. <laughs> Any other questions? Lindsay. Um, so I, I, I also wanted to thank you for your, your work um, and, and giving, uh, um, kind of putting this, this story uh, um, um, out for the public. And that's why I brought my, my daughters and my family here today is to kind of um, be here to share um, this, this piece of history that we often don't get told. My daughter, my oldest one is um, in eighth grade and she's learning American history and we're talking about whether or not she's heard these stories. Um, and, um, you know, they're still not being told in history books and in classrooms. And so um, I just wanted to thank you for that. Uh, so my question is about, um, you know, considering the challenges that you faced being a, a filmmaker in um, in the entertainment industry, what advice would you give to uh, young folks who want to get involved in this industry, um, considering the challenges that you faced? Um, what would you say to them? Well, <clears throat> the the skill set that I needed to develop to be successful here is not unique. Every single industry, every profession has a skill set that's required. What I think was unique for me was is that I did acquire it. I learned the language of Hollywood and I learned what it was that motivated people to say yes. And basically in Hollywood it's about profit and prestige. Uh, those two things are intertwined depending on who the financier is and being able to convince very, very risk adverse, conservative executives that what I have to offer will make them famous and make money and win awards. And that this particular story has that possibility. So. I guess I became a, a master salesman. <laughs> uh, storyteller. And, uh, and I also had to learn finance. So I have mastered the language of money. That and mastering the language of the industry go hand in hand. Now, we've, we've spoken about this in the past in terms of uh, increasing access. One of the things that's uh, both a myth and true about Hollywood, everyone starts out in a mailroom, uh, they work their way up, and they build a network that consists of 
a large portion of the people working in the industry. Those are social networks. They tend to be based on uh, a privilege, uh, the, the kind of schools you go to, things like that. So someone coming into the industry without that, what do you do? Because most, most Chicanos or Latinos will be coming in without that. The Mexicans aren't. They're from the upper class. They've gone to all the best schools. They've been, uh, their kids go to the schools that other producers and go take their kids to. So they're part of that social network to begin with. The fact that I graduated from UCLA with a BA and a Master of Fine Arts in Film was my entry into the industry. Mm -hmm. So I did manage to create relationships out of there. A couple of professors mm -hmm. who really made a difference for me. And um, I met a couple of uh, executives in the industry, uh, two of them Jews and one of them uh, a wasp, uh, who um, decided to mentor me. Mm -hmm. And without that, I, I don't think that I would have been able to have understood what was the language of the industry and how decisions were made and how to be successful as a producer in this industry. So finding that mentorship is vital. And it is what I was, have been committed to, which is to offering that same mentorship to new people who are coming through that I haven't a chance to assist. But it is, I've now had exposure to three very difficult industries to penetrate. Wall Street, in that I've chaired uh, an investment committee that ran an $11 billion pension fund. And in doing that, was constantly being pitched by large private equity firms and broker dealers. And I got into a rather rare, rarefied marketplace. And I've also now had exposure into real estate development because I had to learn that to build movie theaters. So I'm, exing, I'm building a movie theater circuit out of whole cloth, brand new. And of course, the motion picture industry. And I can tell you that my work in Wall Street and my work in real estate is easy in comparison to Hollywood. Hollywood, at least in my experience, is the most difficult industry to penetrate and to achieve access and to prosper in because it is so risk adverse, so nepotistic, so cronyistic, and so exclusive. Easier for a Chicano to become a billionaire than to become the president of a Hollywood studio. And I know a half dozen Chicano billionaires. I don't know any Chicano presidents of any studio. A question back here. Yeah. <laughs> um, my sons are compelling me to defend the youth. Uh, this is my son, he's 12, and this is my other son, he's 15, Sol and Olin. Um, since we, uh, thank you for being here, and thank everybody for being here, but I have a question for you, Mr. Spasa. Um, you mentioned uh, you've been able to peek in and penetrate the uh, Hollywood. Uh, just one simple question, uh, pro-coco or anti-coco? I loved it. I thought it was extraordinary. I wished I had produced it. <laughs> Aside from that. <laughs> no, he's, he's pro. Montezuma, I would like you to, uh, um, one of the things that, that, that was bringing the tears out of my eyes as I was watching the film was um, the courage you were able to capture. Um, what do you attribute that to? How, how, how did that work in terms of, in making the film, um, the, how were you able to capture that? And, and who's, who, who was really sort of the moving force behind that in, in terms of all the people that were involved. And then uh, the second thing would be, can you also comment to the students who are here, uh, how your experience at UCLA uh, during that period of time, uh, 68 through 71, um, how, was that, how did that affect your life? Well, let me understand your question, Sam, and let me honor that Sam 
was one of the people there, right, as Carlos Otto is and Reynaldo Macias, and I don't see anybody else here, but the three gentlemen I just mentioned, please stand up. Carlos, Sam, Reynaldo. These three men could answer any of these questions. They were there. And uh, I regret that I didn't get a chance to see Susan Racho, whose film uh, played a little while ago. Uh, she was more courageous than the four of us. So, you're talking about how to get the courage that was on screen done? Is that the question? That, that's acting. That's easy. That's trained actors realizing a script with a direction uh, from the director who understands what's being done. No, that was easy. That's acting. You know, the, the, the miraculous thing is what was done by these high school students 50 years ago. Right? There, that's where the courage was. Right? Because we were already at college. We had a different perspective. Right? We, we, we had a consciousness about what risk we were taking and what we were doing. And we were full of Che Guevara and Emiliano Zapata and Francisco Villa, right? So we had that that was in the background. But these high school students, right, and I was one year removed from them, I think Renaldo might have been two and you may be three. Carlos, I guess maybe you were, you were a junior when this was going on. Right, so it's, it's different. And we had the background of uh, the civil rights movement, right? So we were watching the farm workers and we were watching the African-American civil rights movement and we were watching the anti-war movement and the free speech movement. These were all antecedents to us. We can't take that much credit. You know, it, it was the time. However, the high school students, they were taking real risks. And so, capturing that, it happened. So putting it on the screen, that's just a skill set. Right now, then. But what they, the writing of the script takes an analysis, it's not just a a description of historical activity is focusing on particular people. And one of the things that was mentioned in this particular movie was that you had engaged in doing a survey two years prior to this one. That's correct. And, uh, and that it had, quote, not made any difference. So maybe talk a little bit about it in that respect with regards to the courage of high school students while they're in high school, as well as as they continue into college, for those that, that do, how it, how that connection, that network, that solidarity, that reflection, that mirroring of courageousness, of commitment to activism, to action, continues. Kind of, you know, you asked me, I think, four questions there. <laughs> special professorial skill that we taught here. I have one question in six parts. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out which one to answer. How did the, yeah, how did okay, the survey the survey. Come okay, about? I can deal yeah. with that one. Yeah, how did the survey come about? Uh, well, you saw the Camp Hiss Kramer mm -hmm. in the film, right? So mm -hmm. I went to it as a 10th grader. Sal Castro invited me to go. He picked me and a couple of other students. And um, at the Camp Hess Kramer, I met Susan Racho. Mm. So Susan and I met in 1965, mm -hmm. right? She was one year ahead of me, no, half a year ahead of me. And I met uh, Vicky Castro, and I met David Sanchez, and I met uh, uh, Ralph Ramirez, and the core of a group that became Young Citizens for Community Action. Now, we were selected 
to be trained as organizers. Mm -hmm. Someone else made a decision that we were leaders, right? And we got tabbed with that. And uh, we then formed a little informal group, and we got together weekly. And Vicky Castro would uh, drive us to events, and she was our, uh, our adult mentor because she was, uh, as I recall, I was in the 10th grade, and she was a sophomore at Cal State LA. And we were hanging out at Father Luce's church for over two years, having conversations at night with Father Luce while he was drinking beer and smoking cigarettes. <laughs> um, and we were there, you know, seeking a beer on our own. Um, we were talking politics, and Father Luce was training us. He was preparing us to be organizers. So I got to UCLA, and half the student body that I met thought I was an outside agitator, not even registered as a student. Because uh, I was here with a mission. I was here to organize a student group that would go back uh, and uh, work on the walkouts, because we had been trying. In fact, in, we tried to have a walkout in June of 67. And we had meetings at the Piranha Coffee House where Sal was there, the football team at Lincoln was there, student body president, a guy named David Arredondo was there, and we made a decision that we weren't ready. Right? That, that group wasn't going to be ready. And then we said, okay, let's target the next year. So it was a very conscious organizing effort. I was trained by uh, the people who trained uh, Cesar Chavez. Fred Ross trained at Seventy School. And Father Luce and Henry Seventy School trained me. So you were tapped and you delivered the entire cohort, it seems. Well, my dad was a Maoanista. <laughs> so I was being trained by my father. My dad was hanging out with Flores Magón in El Monte and here in L.A. back in 1919. I noticed that Victor Villasenor was the writer. What was the story-making process like? Was it collaborative? And did you have um, any say in that and any editing in the well, actual was story? completely in charge. Completely in charge, okay. And, and how and why was he chosen? And what was that process like? Well, Victor wrote the first treatment. He didn't write the uh, full screenplay. He didn't write the final shooting version. Uh, uh, I, I had worked with Victor on the Ballad of Gregorio Cortez, and uh, I had been uh, one of his close friends and uh, uh, had helped him with uh, some of his other books. Uh, he invited me to go to New York to help him get back the rights to Reign of Gold, because the publisher wanted to change the name to Rio Grande and call it fiction. And so he refused to let that happen, and so he was afraid that he was going to go berserk and crazy, so he asked me to fly in. Uh, and I helped negotiate, get the book, book rights back for him. So I knew that Victor had a particular skill set for research, because of all the work that he had done in interviewing his own family, uh, and I've read many of his books up until this, that particular time. And so I hired him to do the same, to prepare the research and the first draft for the Ballad of Gregorio Cortez. He didn't particularly have a strong skill set dramatically in terms of screenplays. But he had amazing skills in terms of doing research. And so I asked him to do the first draft here because of that skill set. But there were other writers who came in later. Uh, that were necessary in order for me to get HBO to finally give the, uh, the movie a green light, which is not unusual. There were actually two other writers that didn't get credit who worked on it. Who were they? Um, I, I, you know, the names have just slipped away. Any other question? Uh, maybe I have one as a way of maybe moving us towards uh, uh, the end and, and allowing for more casual interactions. 
Um, you mentioned about the mindset of the industry and really understanding how one has to pitch a film. And that's for a film that has a certain level of investment in it uh, and, and can have a certain look, can have effects, can have stars attached to it. Tim Sexton Tim was the other writer. Um, he wrote the last draft. So, so I'm credited. Uh, but we've seen on the, on, in terms of Chicano filmmakers, you can get a film made. You can get, you know, you can, you can make, get the film made, but then there's almost nothing that can assure that you'll get it distributed. Um, get it uh, picked up by a distributor, by a, a studio, what have you. So is that part of the kind of reality that, that is informing your effort to move into developing the Maya cinema chain? Yes. Um, I started a film distribution company uh, called My Entertainment, but uh, I launched it right when the recession, the Great Recession hit in 2008, so my company didn't survive and lost about $25 million. Uh, painful. Mm -hmm. And uh, I then was looking at a strategy, small vertical integration because uh, I had had one movie, The Disappearance of Garcia Lorca, which was, a, I thought, a, a really well-made movie that uh, had a lot of production value, had stars, that I'd managed to, uh, with our partners, raise $14 million back in 1996, which was a lot of money, and uh, had sold it to Sony and sold it internationally. And Sony decided that they would release it uh, in New York on a platform release, which I was very excited about, because if it did well on that platform, then it would get rolled out. Mm -hmm. And it did really well. It did $25,000 opening weekend in one week in New York. Sony pulled it, and they decided that they were going to go straight to video because they would make more money mm -hmm. without having to risk print and advertising going straight to video because it had enough stars. And uh, I learned a lesson. I learned the financial lesson of what was going to motivate the studio. And if they didn't see a big theatrical upside, uh, then they were going to go straight to video. So I made a decision at that point, this is uh, 97, that I was going to look at starting a movie theater circuit where I would be able to program and provide young Latino filmmakers and other independent filmmakers a theatrical platform because it is very difficult to get movies into theaters. Very difficult. I mean, pretty much the only way you can do it is that you have to pay to rent and buy out the movie theater yourself. Then the movie theater doesn't care. And it's called four-walling. Yeah. So in fact, in uh, this June, I'm going to announce a new program at Navi, where we're going to invite Latino filmmakers at Navi play their movies in you know, my five locations, which will soon be ten, uh, with uh, guaranteed support, uh, without us taking their rights, that be free to kind of keep their rights, and we'll play their movies and uh, put the posters up, guarantee that the trailers are in the other movies, and uh, support them, and use our social media to let people know about them. So I'm finally getting to fulfill the reason that I created the company. I couldn't do it with just a couple of scale so that I could hire somebody who could actually run that piece of the company, and I just got there. That's great news, and what are the plans in terms of uh, the geographical scope of, of this? You're, you're focusing on Latino uh, cities. cities, populations. Yeah, well right now I'm in the Central Valley, I'm in uh, Bakersfield, uh, Fresno, <laughs> Salinas, uh, Pittsburgh, California, about to open April 25th, you're all invited to the Grand Open, Toledo, California. We will play uh, the Dolores Huerta documentary all week, uh, the Cesar Chavez movie all week. I'm thinking of maybe playing also the Milagro Beanfield War. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that will be how we celebrate the opening of the theater. And then we have uh, theaters that are under construction in North Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, 
Dallas, Phoenix, and India. Those are the next ones. What are your plans for Los Angeles? <laughs> I have five locations that I've identified, but getting the land in LA County is difficult. I need 10 acres to be able to put a movie theater down and park it and have a couple of restaurants next door. It's been difficult finding that land. Yeah. But I'm close. Close. Well, thank you for uh, taking this time with us on a Sunday and, and uh, discussing the film and, and kind of the arc of your career and, and, and what you're doing to expand opportunities for what we see uh, and who gets to make it. Um, any final thoughts or parting words that you may have uh, as we go into the rest of our day? Chicano power! <laughs>